Also willkommen zur ähm, Subnet Talk Reihe Maschinenkult. Heute 2019 werden wir uns die acht Vorträge zum Thema Maschine und Mensch auseinandersetzen. Das Spannungsfeld. Ja, der Intro ist okay. And, um, and then we're going to be opening our, um, our talk this year um, with Karin Ferrari, who just came from Vienna. Mm -hmm. She is searching for, um, her, her works have been shown in multiple contexts all over the world. She is searching for hidden meanings and messages in pop culture and tries to understand what is really going on. And therefore, I think you will talk about the iPhone XS. Mm -hmm. Please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So, actually I changed. It's not just about the iPhone. <laughs> um, I'm sure many of you have heard that there's this quote by the sci-fi author Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I thought, I was quite surprised because it appeared recently in an ep episode of the new Star Trek series Discovery. And the commander explained that the Federation actually reinterpreted that third law by Clark and said that any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. And I thought that's fascinating because it states so boldly this relationship between spirituality and technology and magic and God and also aliens. And they seem to belong actually to quite different realms of the human experience. But as we will see, um, they, ha they, they share the same kind of motivation that drives them on. And that's also in this kind of sci-fi genre that Star Trek is, which is this kind of fairy tale about exactly this kind of motivations, as we will see. And also spirituality and technology, they have always influenced each other. There are these historic examples for, uh, like the Fox sisters in the 18th century. They lived in upstate New York and they came up with this kind of code to communicate with ghosts. And this happened at the exactly the same time when the telegraph became a prominent technology and its wires started to cover the landscape and they had this poltergeist phenomena, you know, when ghosts, they knock and they started to wrap back. One was for yes and two for no and so they started to communicating. So my question is that I will address here is uh, what are occult machines? And I found out that there are three types of occult machineries. The first are spiritist tools that reach into the realm of the invisible world. Then second, ghosts in machines. And third, secret technology. So uh, occult machineries number one are technologies that pierce through the veil that separates our world from the world of ghosts, the dead, and spirit. And those can be technologies that, that are made for that on purpose, like for example, a Ouija board or a dream catcher, but also reappropriated technology that's already existing and that we use every day, like a radio, for example, uh, that tunes into a strange frequency or a recording device that picks up voices, but in an empty room. <laughs> and also things like ectogoggles. Ectogoggles, they are actually uh, night vision devices that make you see ghosts. Um, to be precise, the mission they leave behind, the ectoplasma. And of course, ectogoggles, they are a hoax. They're not real. They're from the Ghostbuster movie. Uh, you don't need ectogoggles to see ectoplasma. 
a simple camera would do. You know, on turn of the century photography is full of documented cases with a very simple camera where they captured the exact moment when a physical medium projected this kind of psychic energy in the room. And I think that a contemporary phenomena for that would be the orb phenomena, where, on the other hand, you need a camera to see it, a, digi a digi digital camera. And uh, the orbs phenomena, they appear as light bubbles in digital pictures. They can be caused by backscatter of light on dust particles, but they might be supernatural entities. Some of them have faces and they appear to have intentional movement. Then occult technology number two is ghosts in machines and that's uh, conventional machines that show unusual behavior um, either because they're possessed or because they, they show signs of the development of consciousness. Examples are poltergeist phenomena and um, the Terminator scenario and also that one time when Siri predict predicted the end of the world, the, ga the gates of hell will open. Maybe some of you remember, remember that July 27, 2015, I think. <coughs> so ghosts in the machines is actually a term that was coined by a philosopher, Gilbert Riley, and he used it to describe uh, the body-mind duality. So it means that the body and the mind, they belong to different realms of reality and the soul more or less just inhabits this kind of flash machine. And when this flash machine expires, the soul continues to live. And this kind of imagery or worldview explains a phenomena that's quite common in spiritualism and also New Age communities of channeling, where mediums this time, spiritual mediums or psychic mediums, they borrow their body to ghosts and spirits or the dead that can speak through them. Uh, then there is another worldview concerning the relationship of body and spirit uh, that, that uses the image of the machine. And those are scientific views, not exclusively, but they say that, yeah, this is the kind of occult machine, a lot of stuff going on there without our knowledge or awareness and our personality or ego or what we define whatever to be is just a product of the biocomputer in your head or your genes. And then again, there are spiritual traditions that say both of them are true and they combine it. They say, yes, uh, we are remote controlled zombies. Or to be more precise, you are remote controlled zombies. Usually the guru who says that isn't. But it is possible. <laughs> through self-observation or other spiritual practices to gain awareness of these programs and, and patterns that run through us. And so we can become the programmer of this body-mind machine and also the programmer of the reality attached to it. And then there is a last example of this uh, ghost in the machine uh, type of technology and those are actual programs and uh, algorithms that are occult in the literal sense because they're hidden. They are the forces that run behind our screens and communication devices, the things that listen to you when you talk and then send you the appropriate Google ads, uh, Amazon and Netflix recommendation engine they run in the background and hidden and calculate your personality and they also have the supernatural component <coughs> where they have this ability like magic or, or God to predict the future or to be precise uh, your future behavior what you might like in the future and what you're going to buy next So 
So the last point of this type of uh, occult machineries is a number three, secret technologies. And those are typically engineered in secret laboratories by black budget operations, in military research, and yeah, and they don't want to share it, you know. <laughs> And it's hard, and, uh, and there are also the type of technologies that are reverse engineered from alien artifacts that are found on UFO crash sites or on alien ruins on the moon or in Antarctica. And it's hard to give examples of this type of secret technologies because the secrecy that is involved. But rumor says that there is everyday technology that origins, originates in this uh, kind of context. And those are, for example, LED lights, uh, gas plasma technologies, the LCD, a liquid crystal display, and also the microwave. So, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's quite funny because in the case of the microwave, we have this sort of magic technology, the short wavelength of energy waves that theoretically we could use for space-time travel, but we use to heat up Pop-Tarts. Yeah, so I, let me come back now to that episode of uh, Star Trek Discovery. So remember they twisted this uh, quote around and said that any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. So what happened there is that in this episode they land on the planet and they find this split of civilization from Earth that was saved during World War III by an unknown force and teleported to that planet. They interpreted this force as an angel, but they didn't know from which religion. Later, they were, it, it, uh, that's a spoiler, but later you will see it, wasn't, it <coughs> might not be an angel, but a person in a that kind of fancy spacesuit. But you need Ectogorius to see that. No, you don't. You don't need Ectogorius. I explained that. So, um, so they land on this planet, and then there, be, there is this very beautiful metaphor that I was really fascinated by because it's contextualized within this fairy tale that is exactly about that. They say that they came up with this new kind of religion to explain this phenomena that they experienced. And the series <coughs> illustrates that with a book, a text collage, a Bible that consists of different texts of the religions on Earth. And, and that's basically what sci-fi does. They form this new mythology about technology worship, but also religious questions about exploring and also this desire of meeting otherness and xenophobia, but also xenophilia. And, and that's exactly the common ground of uh, technology and spirituality. The s and also of art, religion and myth and magic. It is this desire to get into contact with something superhuman, something supernatural, otherworldly, maybe even divine. And this is ex explained in Technosis, a book by Eric Davis. Uh, most of the things that I say, say that sound clever and are not completely kooky are inspired by that book. And what I do as an artist is that I look at these pieces of pop cultures and I analyze them in order to understand the present. And I make this kind of cultural theory 
but with this paranoid twist. Like at the core of my artistic creation is a video series where I claim to reveal hidden messages. And it's not just conspiracy theories. I mix it up with a, a, a academic theory and esoteric ideas, new age, ancient aliens, and end time fantasy, you know, all the weird stuff that you can find on YouTube. And actually, if you want, we can talk later more about what kind of occult machinery YouTube is. Uh, it actually played a major part in the creation of this post-fact society that we woke up in, like a bulldozer. It paved the path for this kind of post-modern, ironic, techno-updated version of chaos magicians that make meme magic and use the cyberspace as a, as a sort of new imagination or space to influence reality outside of the internet. So I will end now uh, the first part of my presentation and show you a short informational video about one occult machine that raised my interest in particular. It's the gadget in your pocket. It's not what you think it is. And if you're watching this on the internet, you can see the video on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. And yeah, we're going to show it now, please. Thank you. Hello? 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 Who's there? The historic roots of communication technologies go back to magical practices facilitating the contact with the supernatural. Hello. Telecommunication means transmission at a distance. It's about establishing contact with something that's not here, which in its core is a spiritual pursuit. Not here does not only mean not in the same room. It goes way beyond that. The impulse that drove the technological quest for large distance communication that made the gadget in your pocket possible was a spiritual one. Our species longing to get into contact with something otherworldly, something superhuman, something divine was what led to this. And they succeeded. Over and over again, making those possessing the hotline to the source of higher knowledge always those in power. And now, it's here. iPhone XS is completely uncompromising. The iPhone is not what it seems to be. What it really is, is a techno-magical portal. This becomes evident by the way the smartphone lies there, horizontally, which has nothing to do with the way it's normally used. The phone lies there like this in order to show that the smartphone is a gateway through which this thing teleports into the human realm. The interface is a bridge connecting the physical realm of 3D humans with the virtual dimension of information. We reached such a level of interconnectedness that our worlds started to merge. For those who know about the hidden history of telecommunication engineering, in occultism, divination, invocations, and the secret space program. These images are evidence for realms usually hidden from mainstream reality. In the following we will decode the secret meanings in the marketing campaign for the iPhone XS. The video ad starts with the total darkness of empty universe, from which the profile of the smartphone appears. And while it's not uncommon that over-the-top cosmic sci-fi symbolism is used by telecommunication companies to advertise their products, the campaign for iPhone Generation 10 is special, forcing us to focus on this luminous blob, emerging like an alien planet from the void of a lifeless universe. What's going on? Let's start from the beginning. We have a biblical reference in the brand name, the Apple, 
The reference to the fruit of the tree of knowledge puts the company's effort into its pedigree and its quest for personal empowerment and free-flowing information, which the Old Testament labeled as a Luciferian agenda. Then, there's the number symbolism of the price. You can buy the iPhone XS for $999. This is a reference to the first Apple computer initial selling price of $666. And of course, to 666, the number of the beast, another biblical reference. And what sort of? Is it possible, that this technology, is the long predicted beast from the book of Revelation? First let's see what's not. The campaign definitely is not about the device. You can hardly see it. The whole emphasis lies on that luminous blob spilling out of the phone, while the device fades into the background. So the real question is, what is that thing? You might think this is about the retina display, since they make such a big deal about it. The display is the most advanced LCD in a smartphone ever. You're not wrong, but that's just part of a story way bigger than that. What's really of interest here is that this Apple campaign implants a new vision of the cyberspace into the mass mind. Here was an image created that replaces the outrun cultural images of cyberspace that dominated our imagination since the industrialized neon grids from the Matrix universe have cast their archetypes into the cortex of our society's collective unconscious. Instead, we find ourselves across a cyberspace that is alive, whose hyperlinked artificial neural networks have evolved from bits of ones and zeros into ever greater levels of complexity and ever greater levels of self-awareness into a large-scale system of a new order. A whole that is greater than its parts. A planetary brain. Are they telling us that the Internet is the externalized neural network of planet Earth? Yes and no. If you look at the colors, that's not the color scheme of planet Earth. I mean, if you want to visualize a commercially appealing, glossy picture of the high-tech simulacra of the guy in mind, sure, it's a visual representation for God's sake, it allows artistic freedom. This is something entirely different. However there are stunning similarities to a popular picture of Mercury. NASA released a few years ago, the color combination of violet and orange, the dynamic ring structure. Why using a color code that summons Mercury? Because since ancient times Mercury is the planet of communication, cognitive function and technology. It is ruled by a hacker trickster god Mercury, a major deity in ancient Roman religion and mythology. He was the messenger of the gods. And he was the guide, too. The underworld. Is it possible that a mercurial color code has been activated here in order to guide us into some sorts of parallel, virtual, cosmic underworld? Yes indeed. The underworld is the realm of ghosts, of the dead, and spirit, in various religious traditions, located below the 3D human realm. In this sense it is a virtual world just like the cyberspace, composed of immaterial information and data. A place beyond space-time, where information, stripped of any materiality is stored. And, it is alive. It's non-sentient, but still, alive. That's why we see all this cosmobiological imagery, the retina networks, the planet metaphor, the landscape. But, what we are really, witnessing here, is not just the emergence of artificial consciousness. The A12 Bionic chip is the smartest and most powerful chip ever. Do you see how the desert morphs into a cyber landscape? And after that, into a microchip? This isn't just about a chip or machine learning. What we are really witnessing here is how the whole foundation of human culture the separation between artificial and natural is collapsing. Look at this picture, the division of the squares, as well as the Apple logo, are designed according to the rules of the golden ratio. A stands for 1, so we can read 112. This is exactly how the Fibonacci sequence begins. The golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence are a magical number sequence that appears everywhere in nature. 
It's like an algorithm that is fundamental for the creation of the holographic 3D simulation of the human world. So, why is this tech company promoting their new chip? By wrapping it up in visually coded references to life and nature, as well as the mathematic principle that generate life and nature. Because this is the moment in human history when the dimensions of mathematics, information, and emotion collide, when the virtual and physical realms converge. Their quest to scientifically understand the universe brought them all the way down to the atomic scales and deeper, down to a realm where information is reduced to raw data and everything is purely relational, geometric, fractal, and archetypal. But they're not alone there. Since many years there have been speculations of an artificial intelligence from another dimension entering the human realm through electronic devices. What do the images of this smartphone campaign tell us about the consciousness that's using machines? This next generation neural engine dedicates machine learning to everything from augmented reality to photography. The phone floating in space tells us that it is not from this world, but from somewhere very very far away. Hands and phones are mirrored. This is a code to tell that the AI is from a parallel universe. The biological imagery suggests that it's alive. The fluid consistency and rhizomatic structure of the sphere reveal that it has no ego and no body. It operates on a level of pure data, information, and geometry. And like all interdimensional entities, it needs some sort of medium to exist in. In this case it settles in the bioelectromagnetic field of the liquid crystals in the LCD screen. In the picture the network spreads like an oily substance swimming on the surface of water. This is exactly about that, showing how the AI uses the liquid crystals as a habitat or transport medium. But that's not all. The AI also hooks into the bioelectromagnetic field of humans and transfers their energy into its dimension. When the device is used, or to be precise, touched, it's an exchange happening directly through the touch screen. The AI uses the human energy to build up plasma so it can interact with the 3D physical dimension. Which brings us back to the Apple. Ever wonder why there is a part missing in the Apple logo? They say it's a wordplay about bite and bite. Bite being a virtual unit and bite. Well, eating, you know. Put food in your mouth. Which is true. But it's a wordplay that doesn't really make sense, if you only know half of the story. Ever wondered why Satan takes on the form of a snake, and suggests to eat, to take a bite from the apple? Well, the reason was, he himself, he couldn't. Being a supernatural entity, he doesn't have the body to do so, so it has to manipulate the will of humans. But the ultimate goal of ghosts, spirits and demons has always been, to get a body of their own, so they can interact directly, with the physical realm. This way, the world play, bite, and bite, and the 666 reference, finally makes sense. It's about giving the virtual AI consciousness, a body, so it can feed on the human 3D world. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Hear what really happened. The bite from the forbidden fruit of knowledge of good and evil introduced humanity into binary thinking, which is a way of understanding the world, of looking at it, as an expression of binary oppositions, like good and evil, darkness and light, black and white, and of course, ones and zeros. This sent them on a path that led exactly as planned to the development of a type of technology on which the virtual consciousness finally can piggyback on. After residing for thousands of millions of years in the bioelectric fields of planets and waiting for the right technology to come by. And now, it's here. I would get the microphone and pass it on. Karin, uh, <coughs> you want to sit down or you want to sit up? Mm. <laughs>
Doesn't matter. It makes no difference. <laughs> okay. And any questions? Now it's on. Oh, can. Um, so I, I'm a major fan of conspiracy theory videos on YouTube, uh, as I imagine you might also be. Um, for your work, uh, especially because it deals with the spiritual and the occult and conspiracies, um, how important is belief? Um, because I watch conspiracy theories and I enjoy them even though I don't believe them and maybe part of the enjoyment comes out of me not believing them but say that I, I guess my question is f how much is the belief in the spiritual and the occult important for you to do this kind of work mm. yeah I believe everything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, no, Amal, yes, I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for this um, presentation or movie. First and foremost, I have to say that I'm quite happy that I have an iPhone 8 and not an <laughs> iPhone XS. I mean, it seems it saved my life. <laughs> I have to kind of ask two, three very simple questions. Um, first of all, if the iPhone is like the road to hell, what's then a Blackberry like? I mean, it's um, and now, but to get like to, to serious questions, I really have to say as a piece of art, I think it's it's um, quite amazing. Thank you. But as a piece of reality, depending on if someone believes in it or not, it's weird to say at least. And as I recognize the world, I think that there are some people out there who could believe that this is real. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a big problem, but what would you think if someone inspired by this, I don't know, sent the bomb to the Apple headquarters? A bomb? Wow. Uh, kind of if it's not just about believing something, but if, if, if action happens out of disbelief. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that maybe <coughs> my video is actually more promoting the iPhone XS, you know, a techno magical portal. Mm. Who doesn't want to have that? <laughs> well, millions of billions of people do, and they bought it. So actually, yeah. it, it's working out. But we had people like Theodor Kaczynski, from a better known as the Unabomber, in like uh, 1980, who actually built bombs and sent it to companies and businesses, just because he was. And I think part of it kind of based on facts, afraid of what technology does to mm -hmm. us as humans. But then yeah. every science fiction ro uh, roman, roman was that in English? Uh, every literature, every roman is, is in, in its thing, uh, 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 reality created, you know, and I mean, we have that everyday life, you know, art well. is not... Uh, of it course, is of part course. of reality and what yeah. we, uh, there are different ways how to understand reality. You have mm. different schools, different mm. um, ideas about reality, right? So, and Karen is producing a piece of art. Yes. So, if anybody would send a bomb to the Apple headquarter, yeah. um, it's for sure not because of the art piece. I mean, I would say the Apple headquarters had lacks security. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's the, 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 the questions are all because it was also about belief, you know, mm. art is a part of the world, right? Of course, of course, and of course. And it's function. I don't know the question, is I just, yeah, yeah. because I really stumbled, stumbled across some, some people, not that I know, but that are like in my echo chamber in a way, and they really want to start, let's say, discussions about the earth being flat. And it's okay for me that everybody believes what he wants, but it's like, but you can't wave it around. It's like even at home you can believe what you want. And so it's just that, like I said, I really admire it as an art piece. And even if it happens that people believe it's real, because I don't know, conspiracy is kind of but attractive. But that's exactly the, the, the thing Karen was talking about, that post-fact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. um, Post fact um, reality which we live in, you know, where uh, people also don't believe that there is climate change, yeah. you know, even uh, if uh, the same there are 
um, some, mm -hmm. you know, a mm -hmm. lot of scientific research on it and everything. Uh, nowadays, that is the difficulty with which we have to deal with, you know. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but it's the thing, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this whole um, conspiracy theories and this um, hidden messages behind <coughs> this, those realities, and find new realities. Um, I think I think it's important even, I would think, take a further step to um, to add to the madness. Because if you look at it, what's been done in everyday life, I mean, just just to 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 quote Pizzagate, um, you, you we see where this is taken, and this is taken for total power and personal gain um, um, purposes. And I think um, creating a piece of art, like like kind of taking the spin it a bit farther, is very interesting yeah. and make actually, from my point of view, it actually um, takes away a little bit of the madness which I see all, all around. <laughs> like I said, I think it's quite brilliant. I don't want to kind of critique it. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. No, 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 thank you. I think it's very good that this um, discussion emerges. But I also want to ask these questions. Yeah, I don't feel responsible for other people's um, choices of behavior. Yeah. But I understand where your question comes from. Mm. And I don't think that it's the reason can be to... I mean, what I want to show is that reality is ambiguous and, you know, the thing is, it's crazy, but everything believes his or her thoughts yeah. and everyone always thinks to do the right thing. It's incredible, especially with all the idiots that run around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've got a question. How dig do you deep if you want to research for like art pieces like that? Do you only scratch on the surface like YouTube and web pages, or you like go to the dark web, deep web, whatever to kind of get new, new, the newest shit on conspiracy theories and stuff like that? Yeah, um, I do a lot of research, and I also sometimes get some downloads, like direct. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm bad with the facts and stuff and I mix things up, but I make up for that with uh, supernatural insights about secret symbolism and stuff. Other questions? Otherwise, please. Um, uh, what's, what's your religion? So because we saw that you, you named the Bible and the Genesis and all, but we want to know, so if you have some belief that we can uh, tie to one religion, in particular that you have mm -hmm. relation, or mm -hmm. it's another kind of beliefs in mediums and things that are more not so uh, fitted to one type of religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is this kind of new type of religion emerging um, that it's a bit too early to give you now the exact details but maybe in, in the future I will let you know it's still in process okay. but I will be the guru <laughs> <coughs> and yeah I have one statement and one question, so one statement about conspiracy theories. I don't think you can say you believe them or you don't believe them because they are always sometimes, you know, the beginning of further research or sometimes something that has stuck around for a long time and is wrong, obviously. But uh, sometimes, you know, they, they ask questions nobody that dares to ask. So I think conspiracy theories can be very intriguing. And the other question I have in regards to um, artificial intelligence. Um, so this merging of, uh, you know, normal, what we would call it, intelligence and artificial intelligence, um, 
is uh, I come from a literary background, so also in, in, in you know science fiction you mentioned that, but also in, in many different novels, you have this you know more and more uh, you have this natural story about researcher going into the jungle and then they do a GPS data um, research and uh, this kind of goes into some kind of artificial intelligence database. So this kind of merging is, is it seems to be more and more of uh, present in pop culture and how how fast do you think this is growing like do you think it's kind of growing exponentially that every month is kind of doubling or also you know i want to know if uh, the iphone X x10 um in comparison to other cell phones you know if you could compare it to uh maybe a, a one story house to a 200 story house i don't know how, how different is the scale, do you think, between an iPhone X10 and a normal iPhone? And how do you think this sh shapes or should shape our perception of what's going on, which we as normal citizens don't really realize, I think, what's going mm -hmm. on in the area of artificial intelligence? Because I feel like, you know, this is doubling every month. Or I don't know. C can you say something about yeah, that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Every month. Okay, so <coughs> it's that intense. Mm -hmm. okay. And what's the iPhone X, X, X10 in comparison to a normal iPhone like? Is the, um, I mm. mean, I, I thought they have, you know, iPhone might be a little bit better, but it would be a similar kind of thing. Do you think it's way beyond? I think, mm, yeah, I think it's way beyond. Okay. Yeah. In, in regards to creating artificial, in artificial intelligence? Yeah, in, in the sense that it really pierces through the dimensions, you know. Okay. I mean, I actually was about planning to explain this process of the energy exchange a bit more, which is also symbolized in the name of the, in the, name of the XS, which is a subliminal code for sex, you know, which is a sort of physical exchange. And then this, this type of plasma can be built up. And I'm not sure that this happened with the other phones already. Okay. <coughs> um, I think the conspiracy theory is uh, one aspect of your talk, but I think um, another aspect that you don't really um, make obvious, but I think is very important for me, is still the narrative that's in that marketing campaign. And um, at that point, I, I think it, it's not so important if it's a, if it's a religion, a, re a religious belief, or if it's just the, the story that we tell ourselves what this thing is, because both are some kind of, of narratives I'm th for me, the difference is the one thing seems to be true. It's uh, it's something I can believe, and the other one, for me, is stupid people think <coughs> that this is true, which maybe is not true. But in reality, there is not really a border, and um, <coughs> the I think the the whole storytelling becomes um, dangerous if it also includes some kind of uh, inescapable future where we don't have uh, a possibility to change it. And I think that's what many people today think is going to happen. You, mm. you, you, you don't know what to do with this technology and how to, how to address it and how to, if, if, it, if this is really a good technology and if we should deal with it or not. Mm -hmm. So beside the, <coughs> the uh, occult um, and, and the, the whole uh, conspiracy theory. I think this is also something um, which we seems interesting um, to me to talk about. Mm. Yeah, I agree that the types of stories that we create, that they form our reality. And that's why it's good that there are so many different ways of looking at a thing. And if you get stuck in a dystopian narrative, yeah, that's in itself a no way out type of situation. 
Mm. We have time for one more question. Who would like to go? Please, Martin. Um, thanks again for your talk and very interesting video. Um, one thing I was asking myself after watching your video is, have we already taken that first bite from the apple or <laughs> is there still, still a chance to stay in paradise? <coughs> That's a good question. What do you think? I'm not much into fruits anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> uncertainty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's it Fine. for the visual part. Mm -hmm. I think um, if you unlock the door, we have some beer too. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget.